Hello everyone. Welcome to How to Maintain Your Kidney Transplant featuring Dr. Neha Garg. Um, just a quick background about the BAAKP, which is the Bay Area Association of Kidney Patients. BAAKP was founded in 2007 to support kidney, to educate and support kidney patients. You can check out our website at baakp.org where we have videos of past pre educational presentations and newsletters, and you can sign up for our upcoming support groups. We have monthly support groups via Zoom, usually on the second Sunday of the month. Our next support group is Sunday, July 11th from one to three, and you can sign up on our website. So today we'd like to welcome Dr. Neha Garg. She's a transplant nephrologist from California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. CPMC performs approximately 200 kidney and kidney pancreas transplants each year. Dr. Garg has been a full-time transplant nephrologist with CPMC for five years and oversees a panel of 2000 plus renal patients in a wide geographical location that encompasses the Bay Area, Reading, Modesto, Fresno, and Roseville. That's, that's a big area. She did her transplant training at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and studied nephrology at University of Illinois in Chicago. Today, Dr. Garg will be telling us how to preserve and take care of our transplanted kidney. Feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Garg via the Q&A button or via chat and we'll answer them at the end of our presentation. And now please welcome Dr. Garg. Yay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. To us today. Thank you, Deborah, for the kind introduction. And thank you to all the BAAKP organizers and all the patients for having me here. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Now I'll begin by um, stating a little bit of the kidney transplant history. So the very first kidney transplant was performed in Boston by Dr. Murray between um, identical twin brothers, which went on to last about eight years. This happened back in 1954, for which Dr. Murray also got a Nobel Prize. Um, between then and now, a huge change in the field of transplantation. So just in 2020 alone, there were about 23,000 kidney only transplants which were performed. And this was just uh, the annual number for United States. And one of the key radical shifts which occurred was back in 1983 when cyclosporin was introduced. So essentially it was with the introduction of cyclosporin, the calcineurin inhibitors that uh, transplants, organ, solid organ transplants from genetically dissimilar or what we call HLA mismatch donors became a real possibility. And in our current era with all of the medications with the uh, armamentarium that we have uh, in today's date, the HLA matching is not even very consequential when we look at long-term kidney graft outcomes. So uh, in almost all living donor transplants now, unless the donor is a family member, a sibling, or a close relative, uh, there are typically a few mismatches which are seen. But again, with our modern era medications, this SL, HLA mismatching is not very consequential when it comes to long-term outcomes in a kidney transplant. So the next slide shows us our long-term outcomes. Um, so we see that one year survival rate after a kidney transplant, uh, this is actually quite good, 93, about 93% 93 for cadaveric donors and higher than 97% for living donors. But as time goes by at around five year, uh, we do see the rate declining somewhat with about a 75% uh, survival rate at the end of five years uh, for cadaveric donors and 85% uh, for kidneys from living donors. Now these living donor kidneys are coming from the healthiest of the healthiest uh, people. So there's obviously a 
lifespan, a survival advantage to kidneys from living donors. And this survival advantage is not seen only in the first transplant, but this advantage actually lasts, uh, it, it, it happens with the second as well as with the third organ transplants, if those were to ever happen in future. Now, um, coming on to the causes of graft loss. So this is a summary slide, which uh, shows us causes of early graft loss. Uh, so the graft loss can be divided uh, chronologically into early versus late. So early graft loss is what we call as a failure of the kidney graft within one year of transplant. Now, this is an uncommon occurrence. We already saw in our previous slide that the incidence of graft loss is only between 3% to 7%. So uh, the failure within first year then is between three to 7%. So for most part, early failure tends to be because of surgical mechanical issues. Uh, renal vein thrombosis is a, a common surgical complication. It, well, not common, but it is one of the commoner causes of graft failure within the first year. So renal vein, when it's procured from the donor, especially in a cadaveric donor, is often prone to injury. So depending on the technique of procurement, the length of the renal vein and how it's uh, sutured into the recipient, if there's a slight kink, sometimes a blood clot can form. And uh, surgically speaking, that tends to be the cause of a vascular event, which can lead to failure of the kidney graft. Uh, there's an entity called primary non-function this is also exclusively seen in kidneys from cadaveric donors. So cadaveric donor kidneys, once they are procured, they have to be preserved in a preservation solution on ice. And uh, this preservation on ice, it's called the cold time or the ice preservation time. So that actually has a bearing on the organ function in future. And some kidneys are just susceptible to what we call a preservation injury. So, and these kidneys, they look very good when we are, when we actually receive them, they look good when they are transplanted as well. So there's nothing apparently wrong. There's nothing grossly wrong on their exam or during the procedure, but they just never function. So uh, primary non-function is seen in about 1% or less cases per year. So the total, again, uh, risk of graft loss within one year just varies from four to 7%, of which 2% would be from the vascular causes, 1% primary non-function, and the rest attributed to other causes like rejection, infections, and which can also include a very severe kind of BK virus infection. Now, um, we'll go on to the rejection in subsequent slides, so I will not elaborate on that here. So these are some of the causes of early graft loss within the first one year. Now, um, then there is this late graft loss. So this is referred to, uh, to the loss of the kidney allograft more than one year from the transplant. This almost uh, always tends to be a multifactorial process. So it is neither just the donor factors or the recipient factors. It tends to be a combination of both donor and multiple recipient factors oftentimes. Uh, all, the kidneys are not all created equal. So depending on the donor's age, the donor's medical history, donor ethnicity, donor's history of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and other such factors, uh, there can be some decline in the nephron mass to begin with. So in a cadaveric donor, uh, the nephron mass, the nephron is the functioning unit of the kidney. So it may not be at a full 100% level. So if there's a reduced nephron mass, if there are fewer functioning units to begin with, then the remainder of the functioning units can easily get stressed because there's a physiologic demand now. So this kidney is in a fully grown adult. Uh, it needs to perform all of its activities, including excretion of the salts, excretion of the acids, excretion of uh, blood urea nitrogen, excretion of creatinine. So all of this kind of contributes towards the workload of the kidney. And if there are fewer cells functioning, then um, 
there's a process called glomerular hypertension which sets in. So because of these overworking residual nephrons, there's this local hypertension which sets in within the kidney. And that then can slowly trigger a, a scarring or a fibrotic process. So we, we kind of call that chronic allograft nephropathy. So for any cause which causes a slow protracted decline in the kidney function, like a decline over three to five years, it's often put in that big category of chronic allograft nephropathy. Now in the past, this was thought to be due to calcineurin inhibitors. So a lot of patients have this question, does tacrolimus contribute to this? Does cyclosporin contribute to kidney scarring? So there have been a lot of research done on this. And uh, in majority of these studies, and these studies, they looked at minimization of calcineurin inhibitors. So when they studied um, long-term outcomes with minimal doses of these calcineurin inhibitors, they really did not find any significant benefit in terms of uh, the in terms of a favorable creatinine or favorable GFR long term. And in fact, almost all of these studies reported higher rejection risk, higher rates of rejection, and uh, early graft loss actually from the rejections. So the thought process regarding this has actually moved away. So now all transplant centers, when you go, you see them, they will all tell you that the tacrolimus and the cyclosporin, they actually confer longer longevity to the kidney. So these are the medicines which actually determine longer outcomes, better outcomes, and not necessarily shorter ones. So, um, so this slow progressive decline can be seen if the quality of the donor kidney is not very optimal. This process, the same process can also be seen as a sequelae to an early rejection. Early rejection is a rejection which occurs within one year of transplant. And again, we'll go on to this in our next slide. Uh, there's a process of late rejection. So late rejection is essentially a rejection which occurs more than one year after transplant. So after the first year, there's a 5% risk of rejection with each subsequent year. So the annual risk is about 5% per year after the first year. Closer, like as time goes by, the risk of rejection goes down, but even long-term it does persist, which is why there's the necessity to continue these immunosuppressions lifelong for the remainder uh, of your uh, allograft. Um, the recurrence of primary disease can be seen so um, glomerular nephritis uh, contributes towards 20-25% incidence of original kidney failure. So uh, in about 20-25% cases of end-stage kidney failure, the uh, initial cause, the triggering cause is glomerular nephritis. And uh, these primary diseases, they can actually recur following transplantation as well. Not initially, not in the first uh, two to three years because uh, the immunosuppression medications are often the treatment medications for the GN diseases as well. But as more and more time goes by, especially after the first five years, we start to see recurrence of glomerular nephritis. Now there's a lot of data on this coming from University of Wisconsin. They actually maintain a big database uh, a registry, a renal allograft disease registry. And based on those registry uh, uh, results and analysis, uh, the highest rate of recurrence um, is that of a primary disease called focal sclerosis. So focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is a primary GN disease, uh, which has the highest incidence of recurrence following transplantation. Uh, and it, the rate can vary anywhere from 20% to 50% in different studies. But recurrence of FSGS uh, is a poor prognostic marker because it can often uh, contribute towards a failure of the kidney graft. Then there are other diseases like IgN nephropathy, lupus, MPGN, which can also recur. But... Uh, um, the recurrence of uh, these other GN diseases is actually less common. So the incidence varies from 10% to about 20-25% in various studies. Um, 
There are some other causes of late graft loss, which includes a BK virus infection. We'll discuss um, this in details in our latter slides. Uh, diabetes, cardiovascular risk factors, and some of the other illnesses uh, like severe chronic diarrhea, or if somebody were to get a severe malignancy, then these can also be contributory causes towards graft loss. Uh, so um, we'll discuss the risk factors a little bit more in detail one by one now. So coming to the risk of acute rejection. So acute rejection within the first year of transplant. So this is a graph showing the uh, percent risk of rejection on the y-axis with the recipient's age group on the x-axis. And what we see here is that younger people are at the highest risk of rejection the first year. So recipients between the age group of 18 to 34 have about a 10% risk of rejection. And as the recipient's age gets uh, more and more advanced, the risk of rejection goes down. And uh, with this in mind, the initial induction regimen or the immunotherapy, the treatment regimen is actually individualized to the recipient's age. So, Younger people tend to require more immunosuppression. And as the recipients get older, uh, the, the dosages of the immunosuppression can be reduced rapidly and to a much lower dose uh, in uh, older uh, recipients. Now, the cumulative risk of early rejection is about 8% in the first year. So although we see an 8% risk of rejection, acute rejections within the first year, they actually rarely cause graft loss. So the graft loss from acute rejections in the first year, it has been reported to be about like two to 3%. So in various studies, the rate of graft loss from acute rejections remains about 2% or less. So not a common cause of graft failure. It's the late rejections which can actually lead to a much rapid loss of the graft life than early rejections. So early rejections tend to be treatable. Uh, the, the only problem with the early rejection again is uh, sometimes it can uh, contribute towards this chronic allograft nephropathy. So it can kind of trigger this smoldering kind of uh, fibrotic uh, scarring process. So a sm slow smoldering process will decline over the next uh, um, two to three years. Sometimes it can take longer, but uh, most often uh, between two to three years. Um, and this has been studied uh, in a lot of different uh, um, uh, data analysis registry studies. And what actually has been found is that early rejection within the first year can contribute to a five-fold increase in chronic allograft nephropathy. Now there's uh, uh, something called sensitization. Uh, so sensitization is formation of antibodies against the donor's HLA molecules. So when we are looking at transplant matching for the purpose of kidney transplant, there are actually six HLA gene loci which are looked at. So there are these six genetic focuses which are important when it comes to kidney transplantation. Um, in the older times when our uh, immunosuppression uh, drug therapy was not as robust, then HLA matching was of great consequence. But now with our current day immunotherapy, the actual matching, the HLA matching is not that important. But if a recipient has already has these antibodies against the donor's HLA molecules, then they already um, have these antibodies which can go and attack the donor kidney, that is of consequence and that's actually prognostic for long-term kidney life survival. So in donors who already have the preformed antibodies, they actually tend to have higher risk of rejection in the first year, and their risk can actually approach about six to 8%. And they also tend to have shorter life of their graft. Um, and this has been documented in multiple studies, including uh, many of the registry studies. 
so, um, so that's actually important, preformed antibodies. And how do people become sensitized? So there are three ways a person can get sensitized to other people's, uh, to foreign HLA molecules. So that is either with a blood transfusion or with the prior organ transplant, that could be liver, kidney, heart, any solid organ transplant done prior, or it could be at the time of pregnancy. So during pregnancy, there can be a little bit of a micro mixing of the fetal blood with the maternal blood. And that can actually sensitize the mother's immune system to the foreign HLA molecules because the fetus has the 50% of the genome comes from the father, which is external to the mother's body. So three ways of getting sensitized. Now, uh, how does a rejection present? So kidney rejection, we often read that it's a painful process that uh, it would present with allograft side pain or hematuria. I have never actually seen that uh, because now again, with the modern day medications, we don't have rejections which are symptomatic. So majority of the rejections, they tend to be completely asymptomatic and uh, hematuria almost um, never occurs. There may be some graft site tenderness. Some people report uh, the feeling uh, kind of uncomfortable, a sense of discomfort, dragging sensation, or slight pain at the site of the graft, but um, hematuria is extremely uncommon. Hematuria is blood in the urine is extremely uncommon. So the only real way of detecting a rejection early and in a timely manner is by looking at the lab work. And this is why the centers are so insistent on getting such frequent labs in the first six months following transplant. So in a way, transplantation is almost like switching dialysis for twice weekly labs in the first few months. So this is the protocol that we follow at CPMC for the first two months. Um, we prefer that our patients have uh, blood work done Mondays and Thursdays, two times a week. Um, in living donor recipients, if they're extremely stable, then sometimes the blood work is just reduced to once a week uh, from the very get-go. And then once a week labs are continued till four to six months. Um, once the recipient reaches the six month mark, uh, and if everything is very stable at that point of time, then the blood work can be reduced to just once a month. Uh, uh, at about two year mark, if everything is very stable and uh, there are no other issues going on, then it's perfectly safe to reduce the lab work to once a quarter. So once every three months uh, suffices then. And uh, in accordance with this lab regimen, um, majority of transplant centers follow the patients very, very closely in the first six months. And oftentimes, some centers would transition the care of their patients to the general, the local nephrologist at about the six-month mark. Now, uh, most transplant centers, at least for the first one, one and a half years, uh, they're very um, uh, good. They're very conscientious about following up on the labs, on all the medications, making immediate changes. So all centers have dedicated nurses for this purpose. They're called your kidney coordinators. And your kidney coordinators will receive all of your lab tests back. And then you'll be getting calls from your coordinator regarding medication adjustments. So they'll be calling you back to let you know that your tacrolimus level is running low or maybe your everolimus level is running low. So you need to adjust this medication to this dose. So, so that kind of... Um, is done uh, very uh, religiously during the first one year. But as the time goes by, and that's, it's the same situation with the majority of all centers, the kidney coordinator keeps getting more and more patients. So at around one year mark, uh, they, they're not able to follow up the labs or like the, the patients kind of are lower down in the lab follow-up priority list. So it's extremely important that in the first one year, all the patients learn how to interpret their own labs. There are only three main items which have to be looked at in your lab report. First, of course, is the serum creatinine. That's the marker of your kidney function then you need to be looking at your tacrolimus level or everolimus level. So these are 
two medicines which are dosed according to the target drug level. And as time goes by from the transplant, your target levels change. So in the first six months, the target levels are maintained at within a much higher range. So cyclosporin, tacrolimus, evrolimus, or sirolimus. So these are the four medicines which are dosed according to your blood levels. Higher levels, first six months, and as more and more time goes by, the target level is brought down by your transplant center. So oftentimes, I think it's a very good idea to ask your doctor, what is my target level? Uh, if you're at eight months, 10 months, like what is my target level now? And then in your lab testing, you should just look at the tar at your drug level and um, see if it is uh, remaining within the target range. If not, then just call your coordinator and uh, make sure to run it by your transplant center. And the third thing to follow up in your lab work is your urine protein. So Every month that you go get your blood work done, your center always asks you to submit a urine sample as well. That's not so much for a urinary tract retention, because if somebody were to have a urinary tract infection, it would most likely be symptomatic. The purpose of that urine test is to actually look at your urine protein because urine protein is one of the best markers of any ongoing kidney injury. And sometimes even when the serum creatinine is completely normal, we start to see a little bit of protein spilling in the urine. And we know that at the level of the kidney, then there is a little bit of glomerular hypertension, which is happening. So when the kidney is, uh, uh, working when it's a little bit overworked or when it's trying to kind of pee out with a higher local blood pressure, like at the level of the kidney, then we start to see some protein excretion in the urine. Um, and uh, that's a good marker that we need to optimize either the blood pressure medication, some of the diabetic medications, or maybe your immunosuppression medications. So, so labs are crucial in the first one year and they remain crucial even after like in subsequent years because the only way to detect uh, kidney rejection early on is to make sure to kind of follow up on your creatinine levels. Now we do have uh, new lab panels uh, which have been introduced in the last uh, five, six years, the panels um, of cell-free DNA. So these are helpful in um, follow up in your long term follow up because if we see a sudden change from your baseline cell free dna panel then uh, that can uh, prognosticate an oncoming rejection so that becomes a part of your testing uh, and some centers use that as a part of their routine testing for long term follow up uh, infections after transplant so um, infections can again be divided into early phase infections, late phase infections after transplant. Now, uh, practically all transplant centers, uh, they use one or the other kind of prophylaxis regimen, either for three months or for six months following the transplant. Now, whenever a recipient gets a transplant, initially they get something called an induction regimen. So induction regimen is these IV medications, uh, which uh, suppresses your immune system in a very big way. And the effect of those induction medicine, it tends to last for about uh, six to seven months. So, uh, and proportionately the risk of infection then becomes the highest in the first uh, six months. Um, which is why uh, practically all transplant centers uh, use prophylactic antibiotic for uh, first three months. Most of them would use it for three months. Some of them would even go up to six months when it comes to antibiotic prophylaxis. So we don't, so when you are on the prophylactic antibiotic, we don't really commonly see severe infections because there's an antibacterial, antiviral, and an antifungal medication already on board. Um, so with the use of prophylaxis, uh, we've stopped seeing that many early infections, uh, but the infections really start setting in at about uh, five or six months or uh, 
a few months after the prophylaxis has been stopped. Urinary tract infections are the commonest of these infections post-transplant. And um, the kidney, because it is sitting right next to the bladder, so if there is a severe bladder infection, it is easy for the kidney to get infected because the infection can easily ascend up to the kidney, which is sitting right next to the bladder. And if there are many, many episodes of these recurrent kidney infection, which is called pyelonephritis, that, that can actually leave a acute kidney injury each time. And just like an injury elsewhere, any injury uh, of tissue anywhere heals with a little bit of scarring. So if there are these acute kidney injury episodes because of severe urinary tract infections, pyelonephritis, then that can also trigger like a slow scarring process of the kidney over a period of time. Uh, BK virus infection is often discussed in the transplant uh, population and it's quite prevalent in the transplant population. Now, BK virus is a urothelial cell virus. Urothelial cells are the cells which line your bladder and which line the inside of the ureter. So that's the tube which is coming from the kidney to the bladder. And the urothelial cells line um, part of the kidney inside where the urine collects. So uh, BK virus is a virus which is typically acquired during childhood. And almost about 60 to 80% of all adults, uh, they actually test positive for BK virus antibodies if we were to test for this. And this is sort of a ubiquitous virus. Uh, the source of infection could be fecal, oral, respiratory, or even during childbirth from your mom. So, <clears throat> so uh, almost 60 to 80% of the adult population would have been exposed to BK virus already during childhood. Um, and um, this is a virus which can start replicating um, in any situation where the immunity is suppressed. So the BK virus can start replicating in pregnancy, in HIV, in severe diabetes, uh, in other solid organ transplants like liver transplant, heart transplant. But uh, in all of these other situations, we don't really see the BK virus um, affecting the kidneys. So, so we don't see BK nephropathy, so the BK affecting the kidney is kind of more exclusive to kidney transplant patients. And uh, what is BK nephropathy? BK nephropathy is essentially this virus ascending up to the kidney where um, it uh, kind of uh, burrows inside the kidney cells. So the kidneys have these tubules and the tubular cells, they can be infected by this virus where the virus goes, sits inside the cell nucleus and then it starts multiplying within the cell and ultimately it causes this uh, cell to lyse, to rupture and it just gets excreted, it gets peed out in the urine. And in fact, uh, when we look at the urine of uh, patients with BK nephropathy, that's what we see. So we see these epithelial cells, these tubular cells, which have the virus inside it, um, uh, which um, uh, with a very long tail. So it almost has what we call a comet-like tail, and these cells are called decoy cells. So in the past, when we did not have um, good biopsy stains to stain the BK virus, then the easy way of looking at it was to look at the urine under the microscope and look for decoy cells, which was an indirect marker of BK nephropathy. It's not a very sensitive marker, so um, it's helpful if you find a decoy cell, but it really tells you nothing if you do not find it, so it's not used very often anymore. Uh, but um, about 60% uh, of the patients can have uh, BK virus in the urine following transplant. And that's because they probably, um, were, they probably were positive for BK to begin with, or the infection could also have been donor derived, like uh, brought over from the uh, kidney graft itself. Uh, BK viremia is a little bit less common. So BK viremia is, viremia means the virus is circulating in the bloodstream. So this is seen in about 10 to 20% of the cases. And in some of the studies, what has been found is 
that um, in that adult population who themselves were negative for the BK virus, who never developed the BK viral infection, or, or who never developed the uh, prevalence of BK themselves, but the donor was BK positive. So these are the people who tend to develop a more severe form of uh, BK virus replication. And they are the ones more at risk of this BK viremia or the virus circulating around in the blood and BK nephropathy. And BK nephropathy essentially means uh, inflammation because of this virus. So this can be seen in up to 10% um, of the uh, cases uh, and can cause graft failure in about 5%. And this is sort of a varying number. So based on different center specific data, the rate of uh, kidney graft failure from this BK nephropathy ranges between five to 15%. Uh, how is this treated? There's actually no treatment for this. Uh, uh, the BK virus replication occurs because of excessive immunosuppression. So the only real therapy for this is cutting down on the immunosuppression medications and letting uh, the recipient's body, letting the immune cells themselves fight the infection. So it's sort of a little bit of a balancing act because as we are backing off the immunosuppression medications, uh, we have to balance the risk of a rejection with the risk of the inflammation. And sometimes that can be sort of a little bit of a challenging job is trying to balance uh, risk of inf rejection with that of uh, a BK uh, related inflammation and nephropathy. And during the, this phase, many centers uh, would ask you to undergo multiple kidney biopsies. And uh, that is the only real way of looking at the extent of kidney inflammation and then making the subsequent decision about the medication and the treatment. Uh, the other common infections are upper respiratory tract infections, URTI are upper respiratory tract infections. So common cold, sinusitis, influenza, parainfluenza, flus, pneumonia, uh, well, these are the upper respiratory tract. So these are very, the, these become quite common after transplant. Uh, the severity tends to be more, the duration tends to be more as well. And there's a much higher risk of these infections than transitioning into a lower respiratory tract infection. And a lower respiratory tract infection is essentially a pneumonia. So, uh, a simple case of flu, influenza, parainfluenza can easily transition into a more severe pneumonia um, in uh, patients who are immunocompromised uh, on these medications. Now, endemic infections can be seen, reactivation of endemic infections. This is very important when it comes to California. Uh, valley fever, it's a kind of a fungal infection. The name of the fungus is cox coxie. We call it, the short form is coxie, the coccidioidomycosis. So this is very prevalent in the Central Valley, uh, Modesto, Fresno, Bakersville area. And at our center, we probably have about one or two cases in a year uh, where um, uh, patients, um, uh, they're doing perfectly fine for one to two years, but they come back with a reactivation of a valley fever. So sometimes it's a reactivation from a prior infection, and sometimes it's just a new infection, uh, a newly acquired valley fever, uh, which can cause pretty severe form of pneumonia and debility. Uh, nocardia is another endemic infection, which is seen in Central Valley. So in very dry, drought cloud environment uh, where there's a lot of dry dust, uh, that's a suitable environment for um, um, increased risk of infections uh, from these. So uh, this is checked um, for California centers would check you for this at the time of transplant, and then you'll be on a longer antifungal medication, a prophylaxis if you do test positive. And the same thing is done at the donor's end as well. The donors are tested for this as well. And if the donor is positive, then uh, we make sure that the recipient remains on the antifungal prophylaxis for a little bit longer. Uh, shingles reactivation is fairly common, often in older adults. Uh, severe pneumonias, um, as we discussed, reactivation of tuberculosis can also be seen in the high-risk uh, population. So. Um, 
in uh, crowded areas or in um, areas where there's a lot of immigrant population with prior exposure to tuberculosis, uh, uh, there is a risk of reactivation of this. And this is why a lot of centers will test you with your quantiferon gold, that's the TB gold testing prior to transplant, and they will insist that you undergo the six month treatment course with isoniazid. So that is meant to treat any latent tuberculosis. So anybody who's been exposed prior, if they do get, if they complete their six month treatment with the isoniazid, the risk of reactivation goes down significantly. Um, what are some of the other preventative measures? Good nutritional status is an absolute must. If the nutritional status of the recipient is good, the risk of infection automatically goes down. Now, after transplant, some patients can have uh, really protracted diarrhea or other stomach issues, uh, kind of malabsorption, just general uh, heartburn symptoms, not, not being able to eat enough. So if any of these symptoms happen, you have to discuss those with your doctor and get those uh, treated right away. Um, Strict control of blood sugars is extremely vital. So that's, that's one of the... Uh, biggest um, differences uh, you can make in terms of your infection control. So all of the extra sugars, high blood sugars, they essentially feed all the bacteria, viruses, and the fungi. And if the sugars are persistently high with a poorly controlled diabetes, the risk of infection goes up significantly higher. Uh, we can avoid infectious contacts. The precautions are the same as what we did for COVID. Uh, nothing different there, a lot of hand hygiene and just, um, avoiding very crowded places in the first uh, four to six months. And if somebody has had a history of a prior serious infection like tuberculosis, valley fever, other fungal infection, they really do need to discuss that with their transplant doctor during their initial evaluation. And then they'll be requiring prophylactic antibiotics for a longer period. It's important to update vaccinations prior to transplant. So, um, the same vaccination regimen as is recommended for everybody else. The only addition here is the pneumovax. The pneumococcal polyvalent vaccine is not typically given to younger adults. So it's a vaccine which is administered every five years to older adults. But um, once um, chronic kidney disease, end-stage renal disease is setting in, it's good to update your pneumococcal vaccine. Now, enlarged prostate and urine retention has become more common in practice now. As more and more older people are getting transplanted, we are starting to see more and more issues with uh, urine retention because of an enlarged prostate. And that can actually cause the BK virus to persist because BK virus essentially lives in the bladder. It's a bladder virus and it thrives in the bladder urothelial lining. So if there's a lot of urine sitting in the bladder that actually promotes uh, the replication of the BK virus. So if anybody were to have any prostate issues, urine retention issues afterwards, after transplant, uh, it's important to get a timely urology consult and follow up with that. Um, coming on to other risk factors for graft failure, so diabetes. So diabetes is the biggest risk factor for kidney failure to begin with. So when I was graduating back in uh, 2013 from my nephrology fellowship, at that time, the, the diabetes um, contributed to just 30% as a cause of uh, end-stage kidney failure. So between 2013 and now, uh, diabetes now contributes towards 50% cases of end-stage kidney failure. So the trajectory just keeps, the slope keeps going up with the diabetes. And it's not just before transplant, even after transplant, diabetes remains a big risk factor towards your future kidney graft failure. So in a lot of kidney biopsy studies, what we have seen is within five years, um, we can start to see diabetic changes in the new kidney graft. So within five years, the changes happen and then they can just keep on getting worse and worse if the blood sugars are not very well controlled. And there's something called new onset diabetes after transplant. So um, the short form of that is NODAT, N-O-D-A-T, new onset of diabetes after transplant. Um, 
this happens because once you have a functioning kidney, the kidney cleans out the insulin very rapidly. So when, when someone is on dialysis, especially on hemodialysis, the blood is dialyzed against a zero sugar dialysate. So the dialysate has no sugar in it. So in a way, during hemodialysis, we are actually removing some of the sugars, not very much, but at least some. And the kidneys are not functioning then. So whatever insulin you are taking, that tends to stick around for really long till your next dialysis session. But after transplant, you have a functioning kidney now and uh, uh, kidney starts cleaning out the insulin. So the insulin is lost um, through renal clearance. So you, you start needing more and more insulin to have the same effect, to have the same control on your blood sugar. The other thing is that the kidney is a gluconeogenic organ. So in the body, liver and kidney can actually produce sugars from non-carbohydrate substrates. So kidney can actually convert fatty acids to sugars, which will make your sugars go up. So if the diet is very high in fatty acids as well, certain fatty acids, they can be converted to sugars then. And the last thing is the medication side effect. So now your calcineurin inhibitors, which is the cyclosporin, the tacrolimus, uh, these medicines called the mTOR inhibitors, which is the evrolimus and the sirolimus. So all four of these, along with the steroids, they all cause insulin resistance. So you need more and more insulin to have the same effect. So there are these three big causes why people can actually develop uh, new diabetes following transplant. And the risk approaches almost as high as 30%. So the five-year risk of NODAP is uh, up to 30%, which is very high. Um, uh, Post-transplant metabolic syndrome. So this has become uh, more common as well in the last one decade. Um, so metabolic syndrome essentially refers to a lot of abdominal weight gain uh, with uh, truncal obesity, where there's a lot of weight around the shoulder, the trunk, the abdominal area, along with some sleep apnea, difficult to control hypertension and high cholesterol. So it's kind of a syndrome of all of these things. And now we have um, a few studies which actually show us that in people with metabolic syndrome, the lifespan of the kidney allograft is less. Um, a lot of this data actually comes from UCLA. So UCLA has a, uh, did a study on this where they actually found that in recipients who, whose body weight is more than 100 kilograms at the time of transplant, they have a shorter five-year kidney graft survival. And, and then there are centers who've actually measured ratios of the kidney size to the recipient size. So the kidney volume to the recipient's volume. And if the kidney volume is very little in comparison to the recipient size, then that also accelerates that slow scarring process of the kidney, what we call glomerulosclerosis. So just scarring of the nephron units of the kidney begins. So it's important, um, for preventative measures to follow a strict diabetic diet. For anybody whose sugars are running high, they need to be on a diabetic diet. Their renal restrictions go away, so they don't have to worry about the potassium. They do not have to worry about the phosphorus, uh, but they do have to be on a low sugar, low carb, carb control diet. Some kind of aerobic exercise. For those who do have sleep apnea, CPAP is very necessary. Uh, CPAP, what it does, it reduces your nighttime blood pressure. So if somebody has sleep apnea, if there's a sort of obstruction at the level of the throat inlet, so when you're sleeping at night, if the oxygen levels go down, it can make your stress hormones, your catecholamines, cortisol levels go up. And that causes nighttime hypertension, which actually goes undetected. And CPAP therapy, uh, to some extent, reverses that process. Uh, so it reduces your nighttime blood pressures, uh, which then helps with the lifespan of your kidney graft. And for those with severe obesity, if they've tried all of the weight loss measures, then consideration of a bariatric procedure is often helpful. And again, uh, with introduction of uh, newer procedures, uh, minimally invasive ones, uh, some of these are actually quite safe from the safety standpoint. Now, 
uh, prednisone comes up as a big question with a lot of patients. Um, and we call that a steroid minimizing or a steroid sparing therapy. So um, one kind of a blanket immunosuppression regimen cannot be used for everybody. As we saw before, in younger patients, uh, they're at higher risk of rejection. If someone has preformed uh, donor antibodies to the donor, if somebody is highly sensitized, they are at a higher risk of rejection. If somebody has received their second or third transplant, then they're definitely at a higher risk of rejection. So in, in some of these patients, um, uh, complete avoidance of steroids um, can actually be more harmful than helpful. So, so there has to be some individualization of therapy which has to happen. And then people who are at, more at risk of these metabolic risk factors are the ones who then benefit the most from steroid minimization or steroid sparing regimen. Uh, so what are some of the dietary recommendations is as a rule of thumb, this is what I tell all of my patients. Sometimes it's, um, kind of hard to figure out what to eat, what not to eat. So for somebody who has diabetes and some chronic kidney disease, the best foods to eat are really the vegetables. So vegetables have absolutely no sugars in them and they have very little carbs, if at all, except for green peas, maybe most of the other vegetables, they don't have a lot of starches. So um, you cannot go wrong with the vegetables, but again, uh, vegetables which come in a preserved format, so which are either in a can, in a Tetra pack, um, they're kind of preserved with a lot of phosphorus-based preservatives. Even if they're low in sodium, they're going to be high in phosphorus. So that kind of defeats the purpose then of doing the vegetables because um, when we are doing these preserved vegetables, we end up putting in a lot of salts into our system. Now, fresh frozen ones are completely acceptable because most fresh frozen vegetables are flash freezed on site. So they don't have a lot of brine solution and they don't have preservatives. So, so it's, it's better to get into the habit of doing a lot of like soups, broth, salads, um, vegetable uh, in the sorted form, baked or whichever way is. So that should be the bulk with uh, your proteins on the side. And when it comes to proteins, lean proteins, white protein is generally better. Uh, red meats tend to be more urea generating and more acid generating. So when we are um, eating red meat, whether it comes from a cow, a buffalo, a pig, or a deer, like a venison. So we are ingesting a lot of animal creatinine then. So these are all uh, animals with a uh, higher muscle mass, muscle load, higher creatinine burden. And um, then we are physiologically making our kidney, like the single kidney work a little bit harder because now the kidney has to get rid of not just the recipients, uh, metabolites, but also what we are ingesting. And um, the, the red meats do lead to more acid generation in the body, which increases the workload of the kidney. So lean meat like, po pro, like poultry or seafood is actually quite good. Uh, the same thing, the same process happens with protein, excessive protein supplements. So GNC or GNC type protein powder supplements, um, a lot of these excessive uh, protein bars, uh, protein shakes, uh, those available at uh, Safeway, Whole Foods. So all of these, they are again, typically um, chemically constituted or coming from uh, animal uh, um, protein uh, products. And it just increases the work burden of the kidney. So cardiovascular risk factors and aging of the kidney. So I want everybody to look at the picture here on the right side. And uh, this is a picture of a CAT scan that is al always looked at at the time of your initial evaluation. So what we see here is uh, essentially your central artery. So we can see uh, that this is the aorta coming uh, down. And at the level of the belly button, it kind of divides into your iliac arteries on each side. And all of that white deposit there, it's the calcium phosphorus deposit. So that is what we call atherosclerosis or peripheral vascular disease. 
And in patients who've been on hemodialysis uh, longer than four or five years, some of these deposits, they start to happen, uh, especially more so in patients who had extremely high phosphorus levels. So this is where the phosphorus goes. So the medical term for this is ossification of your vessels. So this is bone-like material depositing on the inside of the blood vessels. And um, this can cause problems uh, in terms of the longevity of your future transplant, because um, first of all, it makes the surgery itself a little bit more challenging. So if there are these eggshell-like calcifications, uh, putting sutures through eggshell is a lot harder than putting it through uh, uh, elastic, uh, normal blood vessel-like material. So, and then the other thing that can happen is if there's a lot of atherosclerosis everywhere, so atherosclerosis is essentially all of this damage to the internal layer, these deposits inside. So this can um, reduce the blood flow to the kidney uh, allograft. It can also cause a shower of some of this cholesterol into the kidney, and it makes the blood vessels very, very stiff. So instead of being um, elastic and pliable, the blood vessels, they if you actually were to feel them, they start feeling like eggshells. And that can cause the blood pressures to go up extremely high. It makes the blood pressure management more challenging. And then the same slow scarring process of the kidney can set in. Um, uh, cancers, I wanted to just touch base on this. Uh, so um, uh, when we suppress the immune system, the risk of cancers does go up. Your immune cells are also your body's cancer-fighting cells. So for most part, what we see is skin cancer. So these account for almost 40% post-transplant malignancy. The risk is higher in older recipients. It's higher in people who are working out in the fields in agriculture or um, in landscaping and um, places where there's very heavy sun exposure. So sunscreen and protective clothing is a must. Um, there's an entity called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. So this actually includes your lymphomas. So this has a higher incidence in a kidney transplant patient. So uh, at five years, like this is per the OPTN data, at five years, the risk is about 0.6% in adult recipients, but in various other studies, the risk has found to be between one to 3%. So one to 3% above normal is what is seen in transplant patients. Now, there's a slightly higher risk of uh, kidney tumors. And that goes hand in hand with the duration of dialysis. When somebody has been on hemodialysis a very, very long time, that automatically increases the risk of kidney tumors. Now, these are typically easier to treat because if the kidney tumor is restricted to your original native kidney, it's within the kidney, then the treatment is essentially removal of the affected kidney. Um, and um, we don't really see metastatic kidney tumors. I've, I've not really seen a lot of cases of this uh, during my years of practice. And uh, the risk of malignancy is actually highest in those who've had a prior history of malignancy. Uh, coincidentally, in all of the database studies, the risk of breast, breast and prostate cancer has not found to be high. So breast, uh, new onset breast or prostate cancer after transplant, the risk is the same as normal people. But in those who had a prior history of the same, they can have a recurrence after transplant. So the cancer screening should be just your routine cancer screenings as uh, would be age appropriate. So following up with your primary care provider for a pap smear, mammogram, colonoscopy, and your prostate testing as would be otherwise recommended for your age group. So I'm happy to take any questions now. And we have a few here. So I'll begin with the first question here. The first question is um, that the presentation mentions uh, following urine protein in the labs. So what should we look for? And what is the significance of increasing urine protein in long-term, more than 15 years after transplant? What are the usual causes and what would be the treatment? So um, in the urine protein, so when you get your urine analysis result, 
um, one of the row, one of the line items there is essentially that's what it says is urine protein. So it would say trace. When we say trace protein, trace means less than. Uh, uh, the, so there's a gradation for that. So trace proteinuria is less than 30 milligrams per day. Uh, when it goes to one plus, one plus proteinuria would be between 30 to uh, 300 milligrams. Like if you were to quantify it using a 24 hour, that would be the approximation. And uh, more than uh, two plus, then it becomes more than a gram of proteinuria per day. So typically protein in the urine is a marker that at the level of the kidney, there's a little bit of scar tissue which has formed because it's the scar tissue which leaks the protein in the urine. Now, then the question is, where is the scarring coming from? So at 15 years transplant, just the time of the kidney, just the age of the kidney itself can be a risk factor for this. So as the kidney ages, a little bit of scarring can be seen, especially if the kidney is coming from an older donor. Now, if the kidney were to come from a much younger donor in their like 30s or early 40s, then we should not be really seeing proteinuria at 15 years, then the expectation of that would be longer. So the causes of proteinuria could be just the age of the donor kidney, age of the recipient as well, and older recipients, because they do tend to have stiffer blood vessels, uh, a little bit more difficult to treat hypertension. That could be a cause. Diabetes is the commonest cause of protein in the urine. So if the blood sugars are running high, and if the hemoglobin A1C has been higher than 7, 7.5% persistently, that's actually the commonest cause of proteinuria. And lastly, there can be an immunologic component. So um, in that big waste, we call it a wastebasket term, this can, uh, chronic allograft nephropathy. Um, if uh, over a period of time, the dosage of immunosuppression has been less, that can cause a little bit of immunologic process in the kidney, immunologic scarring with some leakage of protein. And that would typically be associated with a slow creep up in the creatinine number as well. So on the urine protein, that's what to follow in the line item where it says urine protein. And if you are starting to see one plus or two plus, then you should discuss that with your nephrologist. And uh, there are treatment uh, medications for this. So typically lisinopril, losartan, or similar medicines are the first line medicines for any cause of proteinuria, and they should be reinstituted early on. And they're also associated then with a longer graft survival. So if the proteinuria is controlled, that correlates with uh, the longevity of your kidney allograft. Now, the second question that I have here is, do we... Um, we've got several about COVID yes. vaccine. Yes. Uh -huh. if you'll skip down, then we'll, we'll lump them all together. Okay, sounds good. Um, so there's a question here that if you experience an early rejection, does the kidney need to be removed surgically? So... Uh, Early rejection is not an indication for kidney removal. So the only time that the kidney really needs to be removed is if there's a severe infection, if it's a persistent focus for an infection or if there's very severe form of beacon nephropathy. Because if the kidney, if there's very severe kind of a rejection which has left a lot of residual kidney damage, then um, it's very likely that the lifespan of that kidney is going to be shorter. So maybe, sometimes it can be as short as just about two years. And in that situation, we are essentially looking at a second transplant in near future. So um, the removal of the kidney is only done if there's going to be a bearing on the second transplant. So if there's a focus of infection or if there's a focus of severe BK, then the kidney needs to come out because we don't want the second transplant getting an infection or the BK uh, nephropathy as well. But in rejection cases, sometimes the first graft actually almost acts like a sponge to absorb some of the circulating antibodies. And removing that only for rejection purposes is more harmful than uh, beneficial. Uh, the only time um, transplant may have to be removed, and we don't see that anymore, again, with our current day medication, if somebody were to develop a severe blood loss in the urine, if they continue to have blood, painful blood loss in the urine because of a rejection episode, 
then that might be a cause for kidney removal. And all these years, I've only, I've never seen such a case, actually, not in the first year, but at a latter point of time, maybe like five, six years out, I've, uh, I've probably just seen one or two cases so far like this. So it's very uncommon. Um, then we have um, a question, why is chronic diarrhea a risk for late graft loss? So in patients who have very severe diarrhea, they're in a chronically dehydrated state. And sometimes the diarrhea can be so severe that uh, it actually requires um, ER visits or hospitalizations for IV fluids. And every time there is a slight acute kidney injury, because for, from any cause, it could be diarrhea, dehydration, uh, all of these injuries, they do leave a little bit of scar tissue behind. So uh, each episode of acute kidney injury, it, like in a staggered manner, can contribute. It can become like a cumulative chronic kidney disease then. The other issue with chronic diarrhea is um, when there are more than five, six bowel movements in a day, a lot of bicarb, a lot of alkali from the body, it gets um, excreted out in these loose stools. And when you're peeing, when you're uh, not peeing, but when you have all this alkali coming out in your stools, uh, the acid levels go up in the blood. So there's a little bit of a pH imbalance. And this is a state of chronic acidosis because you're losing alkali and chronic acidosis can also trigger a little bit of kidney scarring. So in somebody who has chronic diarrhea, they should have the cause of diarrhea looked at. And if they are chronically acidotic, then they should uh, definitely be on that sodium bicarbonate to correct that acidosis. Two questions down is, can slow kidney scarring be a risk? <laughs> so, um, uh, this, uh, so this is, uh, yes, yeah. If, if somebody were to figure the answer to this question, that would actually solve a lot of problems. So it cannot be arrested completely. It can actually be slowed down. So your um, the medicines which come under the umbrella of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, so the medicines like lisinopril, losartan, valsartan, um, and all of these, uh, the uh, ramipril and nalapril, the prills and the sartans, these are the medicines which can actually arrest kidney scarring to some extent. And these are the only proven medicines, the only um, class of medicines which have been shown to actually do that, to accomplish that to some extent. Um, then we have, um, is there, this is a very interesting question here. Is there a thing as too much exercise? I exercise a lot and consistently, which includes aerobics, uh, weight training, lifting yoga to keep my physical and mental well being as well as my transplant working. But is too much working out bad for the transplant? So, um, aerobics or any kind of aerobics, yoga, uh, or lower level weight training is actually very beneficial because that's just generally beneficial for your overall cardiovascular health. It keeps your blood vessels very flexible, pliable, keeps your resting blood pressure in a lower, like in a very well-managed state. But um, in people who do very excessive bench presses, so if someone is lifting like 160, 200 pounds, and there are people actually who do that, then that's uh, probably not good because when you're trying to bench press uh, more than 150 pounds, you can actually feel like the surge of blood going up, like the face becomes red and that's the blood pressure going up. So during that period of time, at least, uh, we have these huge surges in your blood pressure. So I think very excessive weight lifting is, um, uh, or with very heavy weights is necessarily not a very good practice, but a lower level weight uh, or whatever is comfortable with more frequent repetition is the ideal way to go. And uh, there's no such thing as excessive exercise. If you're feeling very healthy and well with the amount of exercise that you are doing, then that's perfect. That's the way to be. But all of that exercise should not go hand in hand with excessive protein supplements because many a times then the thought is that if you are exercising this much, we should be doing a lot of uh, protein supplements as well. And as a rule of thumb, um, in any kidney patient, um, the protein intake should be one gram per kilogram body weight. Uh, or you can, 
in states of very excessive exercise, you can probably go up to 1.2 to 1.3 gram per kilogram body weight, but it really should not be more than that. With one kidney, uh, too much of protein again is just, um, just asking the kidney to work a little bit more than it can. Um, and then there's a question about uh, uh, diet again, is rice and pasta okay to eat or is it something transplant patients should be careful with? Now, rice and pasta is completely acceptable in non-diabetic patients. So both are uh, starches, the, the both carbs. So if the blood sugars are perfectly normal, then um, there is uh, no issues uh, doing the rice and pasta, but we saw that uh, all transplant patients are at about a, 30% risk of diabetes at five years. So um, as long as everything is in moderation. So with food, the rule of thumb should be in moderation. So if uh, you're having, and moderation means doing something about three times a week. So when we are, and even the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, like this is a question which comes up often, is if somebody could do an occasional Aleve or Advil, as long as it is less than three times a week, uh, ideally avoid it, but if somebody really needs it, they can do it once in a while here or there. And same thing applies to all the food products is um, red meat should not be completely avoided is there's an allowance to do that once or twice a week, which is perfectly fine. Same thing goes for your protein shakes, protein powders, and um, a high starch foods, as long as it is in moderation, should be perfectly fine. And then there's this question of what do you think of a plant-based vegetarian or a vegan diet? So um, with the vegan diet, what we've often seen, especially in frailer patients, so we always have these, um, and actually I, this might sound a little bit sexist, but women tend to do it more, is they tend to follow vegan diets more strictly. And sometimes um, if they're having chronic diarrhea or um, just kind of a medication intolerance, then they don't have a lot of reserve. They tend to lose their body strength like a little bit too soon, too fast if they are restricted in terms of, uh, way, way restricted in terms of the food intake. So overall doing more vegetarian products, uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, fruits more so if you're non-diabetic. For a diabetic, you will probably have to limit your fruit intake as well because fruits are sugary. But if there's no diabetes, then doing a lot of fruits and vegetables is definitely more beneficial in terms of your kidney function because these are all alkaline foods. So naturally, uh, the foods tend to be converted to alkali in the body. That's a natural way of getting alkali in with very little sodium salts or phosphorus preservatives and natural food items tend to be high in potassium, not in sodium. So, and all of these are actually good for the general longevity of the kidney. So like the ideal diet would be some fruit, some vegetables with a little bit of lean uh, meats, uh, your poultry, seafood, uh, some dairy and some red meats and nuts. So a little bit of everything, but more vegetables would be preferable to add bulk to your food. And then there's a question, are beans a good food for us? So beans are high in protein. They're also high in starches. So again, if you're not a diabetic, you can do a lot of red beans, pinto beans. That's a very good source of uh, proteins, antioxidants, but they're also high in carbs. So if you're a diabetic, then you cannot do a burrito with a tortilla beans and rice. Then you can just do like a bean salad. So you can do beans with a lot of vegetables or again, chicken or eggs or fish, then that way you're cutting down on your carbs. And uh, there's another question. I drink a lot of water every day as a transplant recipient, about a gallon a day, and I'm quite active. Is there a point of too much water? So if there's too much water in the intake, then it dilutes out the sodium. So that's where you need to follow your labs. If you notice that your sodium number is coming to 130 or less, so then that's too much water in the system. So too much water will dilute out the sodium. And that's the cue that we need to back off. But there's no such thing as too much water. Otherwise, if you're feeling thirsty and if you're feeling comfortable and healthy with drinking more water, then that's how it should be. And some people do tend to urinate more uh, because they're not enough nerves around the kidney. So after a kidney 
is put in, it takes about um, a few months for new nerves to form around the kidney. And uh, during that time, the kidney really does not know that it is supposed to hold on to some salt and water. So that's why that polyuric phase is seen. So initially in the first few months after transplant, almost everybody is peeing continuously, like even after they've stopped looking at the clock, they just keep going. And um, that process takes about three, four months to slow down. But for some people that polyuria can actually persist and they'll be more thirsty more often then. Uh, then um, there's a question about how bad is stress or anger for the health of a transplant patient? Well, if the anger is causing a huge surge in the cortisol and the adrenaline le levels, then that's probably not very good if it's making your blood pressures go high. But I guess if it's not having um, an effect on the blood pressures, well, it's, if it's a milder form of anger, then probably okay. <laughs> And, um, and then there's a question is for a PKD patient, will they have recurrence of PKD? No. So PKD is a genetic uh, disorder which affects only your native kidneys. So it's a genetic defect in your native kidneys. The cells, they kind of lack a protein which causes normal cell growth. So, and because of that lack of that protein, the cells, they start multiplying in the native kidneys. So after transplant, because you have a kidney from a donor who has a completely normal cell structure, PKD is completely cured. And in fact, after transplant, because your body is diverting more blood to your new kidney allograft, so there's a preferential redistribution of blood flow to the new kidney, whatever cysts you have in your native kidneys, they actually stop uh, becoming large as well. So there's a little bit uh, slower progression of your PKD after transplant. And PKD cysts, uh, they also, uh, they're completely normal cells. So these are cells which are just dividing faster, but they're not abnormal or atypical. So the risk of cancers is not necessarily high in PKD patients. What increases the cancer risk is the duration on dialysis, not the PKD itself. So let's, let's skip. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left to the okay. COVID-19 questions. Okay. Questions about the efficacy of the current vaccines. Should we have boosters? What can yes. you tell us? So with the COVID vaccine now, now that we have data coming from the John Hopkins registry, so they studied about, I think, 600 uh, patients and uh, the antibodies were tested 20 days after the first shot and 20 days after the second shot. And these were the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna. So what they found was that the response rate was only 15, 1-5%, 20 days after the first shot. And it went up to just about 55% after 20 days after the second shot. So there's definitely a, a lack of um, kind of um, a full response because in normal population, the response rate is 95%. So there's a huge gap in the response rate between transplant patients versus the normal population. Um, so far, uh, CDC and the Infectious Disease Society, they are not recommending a third booster, nor are they recommending serological tests for the antibodies. Um, the reason for not testing the antibodies is because all of these different tests, they are def they're testing different kinds of antibodies. And when you get a vaccine, the vaccine only produces this one kind of antibody to the COVID S1 spike protein. So if you're testing response to the vaccine, you need to have that very specific antibody test, which actually measures that spike protein antibody. And with all of the tests that we have, it's, it's actually very difficult to tell which one is testing which. So, um, so this, this first issue is with the testing and the interpretation of the test. Is it accurately testing the antibody produced by the vaccine or not? So that's the first concern. Um, the, the second thing is now that there are so many new variants of this COVID virus, now with that Delta strain coming in, it is quite likely that uh, boosters will have to be administered to pretty much everybody 
uh, with a booster dose that actually works against the new variant. So going back uh, to get the booster against uh, like the old variants may not even be beneficial at this point of time. So I think boosters are anyways going to be coming in soon for uh, pretty much everybody, which would include um, uh, the antigens to, from the new strain. Uh, and then the last thing with uh, the COVID vaccine is, um, so in people who are otherwise healthy, maybe like two years or longer from their transplant on a slightly lower dose of Celsept. So Celsept or your mycophenolate is the medicine which actually is um, uh, the most potent in terms of your immunosuppression. So when someone is on a full dose of Celsept or mycophenolate, and a full dose is about two grams per day, so one gram in the morning, one gram in the evening. So with that dose, it would be difficult to mount a response to any vaccine. So whether it be it COVID vaccine or hepatitis B vaccine or any other vaccine, it would be difficult with a full dose of Celsept on board. But in people who've been longer out from their transplant on a little bit less of the mycophenolate, they're actually the ones who are likely to develop. Uh, they'll probably be in that 54, 55% of the population who actually did demonstrate a response. Do you recommend that transplant patients still social distance and wear masks in public? Or is it okay to unmask and practice good hand hygiene? What do you so in a crowded indoor situation, it is better to have the mask on because we know that the response rate, the vaccine response rate is only 55%. So knowing that even with the second dose, the response rate is only 55%, that uh, leaves the other 45% people quite susceptible. So if as long as it's, uh, if it's outdoor gathering or an open air, good air circulation, then it's a lot safer. But if it's an indoor gathering with a lot of people, it's best to actually keep the mask on. And, and hand hygiene should be uh, exercised no matter what, because if you are going outdoors as well, we never know who has touched the elevator button or the railings on the side, or it's just better to just come back, wash the hands regardless. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think that answers all of the COVID questions. Um, is lisinopril medication better for a person with kidney transplant than Levitol for blood pressure? So, so the decision about your blood pressure medicine is made taking into account um, other factors. So in a patient who also has any underlying cardiac disease, if somebody has any kind of coronary artery disease, whether or if they've required any stent placements inside the heart or any arrhythmia issues, then libitolol is a better medication because uh, not only is a blood pressure medicine, it's also cardioprotective medicine. Now, lisinopril is, uh, becomes more important if uh, there's a blood pressure issue, but we are starting to see some protein losses in the urine. So lisinopril is more a renoprotective medicine that uh, protects against uh, the proteinuria, protein losses. And then that's a compelling argument to do that. So it kind of depends on what other risk factors, uh, the decision would depend on that. Um, what is the role of long-term baby aspirin res regimen in kidney transplant? Is it beneficial, so, a risk, or really intended for independent issues like cardiovascular? Yes. So the baby aspirin is not so much for the kidney transplant itself long-term. It's really more for prevention of your general cardiovascular risk factor. So in all people who have diabetes, hypertension, uh, use of baby aspirin has to be, it has shown to reduce the risk of strokes in future. Now, when it comes to kidney transplants, uh, especially those from living donors, at around six or seven months in uh, kidneys coming from relatively younger donors, there's a process called post-transplant erythrocytosis. So the epogen, the RNS that uh, people get on dialysis, that uh, anemia injection, that's essentially a hormone. That hormone is produced by the kidney. So after transplant, about six, eight months after uh, from a younger donor, uh, the kidney can actually start producing excessive epogen and that makes the blood counts go up higher. So the hemoglobin can go up to 17 grams. And when we look at that hematocrit number, that's the blood count can go up to 51, which is on the higher side. So 
uh, essentially the blood becomes thicker and it becomes slightly sluggish. So that's where aspirin then becomes very important in kidney transplant patients. Anybody who has a slightly higher red blood cell count, it's always better to be on a baby aspirin uh, because um, the blood is more viscous then. Right. Um, we've only got a couple more, couple yes. more minutes to go. Um, I guess the, the first question about is asking about mycophenolate, since they don't measure it in your blood system. How do you determine if a patient's getting too little or too much? much? Or too little. So the mycophenolate drug levels are extremely erratic. So mycophenolate actually goes through, through cy two cycles. So first, when we ingest it, it's immediately absorbed in the blood. So there's a peak right away. And then it actually goes through what we call an enterohepatic circulation. So from the intestines, it actually goes to the liver and then it comes out again through bile. So there's like a second peak. So, uh, so that's why measuring mycophenolate levels is very challenging because you have absolutely no way of knowing uh, at which peak you're getting it or where's the trough. Uh, the way to determine um, the toxicity is really going clinically. So if there's too much mycophenolate on board, what we would typically see is that the white blood cell count would be on the lower end. It starts to uh, cause anemia, cytopenias, low cell counts. It can start causing uh, a little bit of stomach upset, like uh, unexplained um, GI symptoms, stomach symptoms, unexplained weight loss sometimes. Some people have this inability to gain weight. And that's just the mycophenolate causing it. And when we back off on the mycophenolate, then uh, the weight starts getting better. Now, some of the dosing of this drug is also weight-based. So when uh, in your long-term regimen, if uh, somebody is like 90 to 100 kilos, they need more of mycophenolate. But if somebody is just 40, 45 kilograms, then automatically the center will start coming down on their mycophenolate dose sooner. So part of it is weight-based dosing. Okay. Um, uh, and one last question. I'm sorry, we're not gonna be able to get to everybody. This has been so interesting. Thank you so much. Other than dehydration and eating food, like a lot of red meat high in creatine, what other exogenous factors can affect serum creatinine. creatinine levels. So the only other factors would be some of the medications. Uh, so there's some, so the way the creatinine is peed out in the urine, about 85% of it directly goes into the urine. So like think of your glomerulus like a sieve. So it just sieved out, 85% gets sieved out. And then it goes through this really long tubule where another 15% is added, like actively, like the tubular cells, they keep adding it to the urine as the urine is going through that tubule. So that 15% um, secretion, what we call that, can be affected by certain medications. Uh, so cimetidine is a very big one. It used to be used a lot before. Now, I don't think anybody gets cimetidine anymore. A lot of drug interactions with that. Bactrim can cause that. Um, there are some other antibiotics uh, which can cause um, uh, kind of a fluctuation with your creatinine uh, secretion. Not very common. Commonly used medications would not do that. But um, apart from dehydration and food, the other thing which could affect creatinine level is the muscle mass because creatinine essentially is a muscle protein. So it's coming from your own muscles. So if suddenly somebody decided to go and again, start doing a lot of uh, bench presses or if they really want to bulk up, then the creatine will go up by like 0.2 or 0.3, which is just a normal response to the physiologic bulking up of the body. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. for your Thank you. And it was so interesting and we so appreciate your coming and speaking oh, to us. Absolutely. No, thank you for having me Wonderful. here. I can actually answer all of the questions, the remaining, they're not very many. I'll be happy okay, to yeah. answer them. And uh, that is if, uh, if the ahead. time permits. Yes. <laughs> so there's a question which says that I'm having trouble sleeping lately and I'm sleeping too late and not enough, less than eight hours a day. Um, how bad is it for my transplant? So um, sleep per se will not have an effect on the transplant. If you are well rested, like if you are 
if you get like a good enough, like it's the quality of rest, not necessarily the quantity which matters because the purpose of sleep and rest is to bring down your cortisol and your catecholamines, like your active hormones have to come down. And if you're feeling that state of rest, like not constantly anxious or sort of like worked up, then it's very likely that your resting blood pressures are probably at goal. So that's what sleep does is when we sleep, our blood pressures tend to drop by about 10% at night. And that's the goal of sleep is to be rested, have low blood pressures. And you can follow that yourself. You can probably measure your blood pressures uh, morning and evening and see if your morning blood pressures are running very high. If every single day, if you, the morning blood pressures are disproportionately high, then uh, that would indicate um, that the sleep is not very good, in which case then um, you probably need to figure out why, why you're not sleeping well at night. Is it like sleep apnea or is it some anxiety issue or like um, sometimes the tacrolimus can interfere with sleep, could be a drug related effect. So then it needs to be narrowed down to the cause. Um, then uh, there's a question, uh, what factors should we watch out uh, for um, when currently on hemodialysis followed by peritoneal dialysis after first transplant fa failed. So when you are on a hemodialysis, uh, the problem with hemodialysis is phosphorus deposition inside the blood vessels. We saw that in the picture that hemodialysis tends to have high amounts of calcium in the dialysate. And when we combine that with high phosphorus in the blood, that calcium phosphorus goes and deposits. That's the biggest side effect of hemodialysis in terms of your future transplant. When it comes to peritoneal dialysis, peritoneal dialysis is putting a lot of dextrose solution in your abdomen every day. So this is called sugar solution. And sometimes the sugar calories can be almost as high as about 5,000 calories at nighttime each night. So when you are on peritoneal, uh, one of the side effects of peritoneal is unfortunately abdominal weight gain. And some people can have a lot of weight, like suddenly the, they start gaining weight in the abdomen. So the minute you get transitioned to peritoneal, you have to completely eliminate all of your sugars and carbs and completely go carb free because you're already getting anywhere between 3000 to 5000 sugar calories per day. So, and then the diet, has to be a little bit more restrictive with a lot of aerobic workout because the only way to burn off that excess sugar is by walking or running or and with the peritoneal catheter then you cannot do any heavy weights either but there's no restriction again on brisk walking and even running on a treadmill would be perfectly fine. Uh, then uh, there's a question that uh, I have been researching different wellness routines for better health are cold showers taking ice cold uh, ice water baths okay to try for transplant patients? What about using sensory deprivation float tanks uh, and floating in about thousand pounds of Epsom? This sounds very nice. Just floating mm -hmm. in about thousand pounds of Epsom salt water to decrease uh, stress and meditate. Um, a cold water showers, actually, when we think of it physiologically now, there's no data on this. I'm just kind of making this up. But if you stand under a ice cold water shower, there's a huge parasympathetic surge. You can actually kind of initially feel your heart rate going down. And, uh, and generally your parasympathetic surges are restful. Your parasympathetic system is the resting system. So that's uh, what happens when you sleep is the parasympathetic drive goes up and the sympathetic system, the adrenaline system comes down. And um, cold water is actually a way of doing that. Um, they say that in yoga, but um, I think you kind of experience that too when you do that. So I, as long, I mean, I'm not sure if there's an upside to it, but I don't uh, think there may be a downside, although ice water bath sounds very aggressive. <laughs> That, that might actually, I, I'm not sure if it would cause a sympathetic versus a parasympathetic surge then. And I'm not very familiar with the sensory deprivation, the float tanks, but if it's something which is very restful, which br again brings your blood pressure down and meditation would do that is when you're well rested, meditation as a state is a restful state. So if it's bringing the blood pressures down, it's uh, likely to be helpful then. 
the next question that we have is five years after transplant, I have been taken off mycophenolate entirely and given five milligrams of prednisone instead as a student. Now, if you've been taken off mycophenolate entirely, there has to be a very good reason for doing that. So that is probably related to either a severe infection or a concern with some kind of a malignancy. And whenever there's a concern with a ser very serious kind of an infection or malignancy, where the risk of, where there's actually a risk to your life uh, from either of these, then sometimes the only alternative is to completely stop all mycophenolate and just continue with prednisone. It also depends on your initial matching status. We talked about the HLA molecules. Uh, so in people who have no preformed antibodies and where the HLA, the matching status is excellent, uh, these people can actually technically be on a lower dose immunosuppression as well. But um, in all likelihood, it's probably related to an infection or a concern for a malignancy. Then the next question is, is aspirin 81 milligrams per day safe for our kidney? Yes, there's no... Um, if there's no bleeding tendency, then there's really no side effect of a baby aspirin per day. And in fact, in people with kidney disease, hypertension, diabetes, a low dose baby aspirin has been shown to reduce the stroke risk in future. So which is why it's prescribed uh, for general cardiovascular risk prevention. Um, then there's this question for younger recipients, when is pregnancy possible and what will be the side effect for the transplanted kidney? So pregnancy is um, a high stress state uh, for uh, the kidneys, for the mother's body. So when a woman gets pregnant, is the kidney has to deal with the mother's toxins as well as the baby's toxin. And then there's also this huge increase in the salt water load because you have so much amniotic fluid weight, there's a salt water which then the kidney has to pee out. Uh, so that increases the work burden of the kidney. But um, it's not just the work burden of the kidney, there is a slightly higher risk of developing a rejection with pregnancy. Uh, because um, as your total body volume increases, as your weight increases, it dilutes out the tacrolimus and some of the medications in the system. So you have to be very good about following up with your doctor closely to maintain the tacrolimus, the uh, tacrolimus levels within range. And then the third thing is that mycophenolate or cell set uh, cannot be given during pregnancy. So because that's uh, toxic to the fetus can cause fetal malformation. So you have to come off the mycophenolate, the cell set first, and it's typically transitioned to an alternative called the azathioprine or imuran. So that's a weaker anti-rejection medicine. So the risk of rejection goes up slightly during pregnancy. Um, so the pregnancy should really be planned um, about one and a half years after transplant, certainly not within the first one year of transplant, that's a contraindication. Um, and the more the time is there between the transplant and the pregnancy, the safer it is for you because the longer the kidney has been there in your body, there's a process called accommodation which occurs. So with each subsequent year, the risk of rejection goes down. And then that makes your pregnancy safer and safer with time because your risk of rejection is less. But it also depends on the maternal age, because if your age is already 35, 36 years, then with each advancing year, uh, the pregnancy becomes more risky because of the maternal age. So it's uh, if you're in your like early 30s, late 20s, then it's perfectly safe to plan your pregnancy later, like wait for two, three years then. But if you're already in your mid thirties, then it's better to wait at least one and a half years before planning your pregnancy. Uh, then the next question is, what is the role of membranous in graft survival? Can it be treated if it is present early and resolves? Does it tend to come back? So membranous nephropathy is a form of glomerulonephritis. It uh, causes about 10% uh, kidney failure. Like if you were to look at the ESRD population, it accounts for 8 to 10% uh, maybe of uh, kidney failure cases. Uh, it can be treated. Now, there is a treatment for membranous uh, medication called rituximab, which has been found to be quite uh, successful in treatment of membranous nephropathy. And it can 
occur after transplant, although the chances of membranous uh, happening after transplant are less as compared to the other uh, GN diseases, uh, membranous um, has less likelihood of recurrence, but yes, it can happen. And when it does, the treatment remains the same. It's typically treated with that medicine rituximab. Um, and of course, the ACE inhibitors, the lisinopril, losartan, they are the mainstay in membranous. Um, and, um, and that's the only treatment that can be done. Now I've seen in the last five years that I've been here, so about like a thousand uh, transplant uh, patients, about two cases of early membranous happening within the first one year of transplant. And um, one of them actually resolved, was uh, treated. The other one had a slower progression over like three, four years towards failure. So, um, but the, I think in terms of GN, the overall rate of recurrence is less for membranous. Um, and then there's a question, is there a natural way for us to increase GFR and lower creatinine levels? Um, so the glomerular filtration rate, it's sort of a set rate because it depends on the number of uh, kidney cells you were born with. Now in a normal size person, like if they are normal for their age, like if they're not, um, if they were born full term, then they are born with mature kidneys. And uh, the normal GFR for anybody uh, would be between 100 to 120 mLs per minute. So that's the rate at which uh, the kind of the blood, the serum plasma is going through the kidneys and the filtrate coming out. Now, uh, there's no natural way. I don't, there's no medication which actually exists um, in today's date which can treat your kidney uh, GFR numbers. So um, if uh, uh, that were the case, like uh, a lot of the chronic kidney disease could actually be arrested with such a medicine. So the natural way would be to not stress the kidney by adding more workload. So uh, what increases the work burden of the kidney is essentially excessive salts. And that does not, that's not just the sodium salts, any kind of salts, whether it's phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, these are all salts. And it's the kidney's job to pee it out in the urine. So if we were to move towards a lower salt diet, then the kidney does not have to work very hard. It's not overburdened. Same thing applies again for red meats and high acid food products is if you're putting in a lot of acids in the system, which is essentially red meats and sodas contribute to that too. So carbonated water is essentially carbonic acid. Uh, is uh, It changes the pH of the system. So then it makes the kidney work a little bit more. So if we just take off some of these burdens from the kidney and the third one is being uh, is metabolic syndrome being overweight. So if we ourselves are overweight, then that also increases the work burden of the kidney because the hormonal panel becomes unfavorable when we are overweight, like the typically the aldosterone tends to go up, cortisol tends to go up, causes high blood pressure, and it starts affecting the kidney function. So, so these are some of the natural things is a lower salt diet, more natural foods, less processed foods. So uh, avoiding the phosphorus aisle, um, like in at Trader Joe's or Safeway. So I, so wherever there is like that aisle where there's a lot of packaged food with salsa, pasta sauces, and a lot of like the cheese and all those dips um, or the Tetra packs and the cans, those are the phosphorus aisles. So those are the aisles to be avoided as much as possible. So if we start doing that, um, then uh, whatever GFR we have, it will keep it right there. There's no reason why it should decline any further. So so like if we lead a healthy lifestyle yes, yes. diet exercise low salt not only are we protecting our kidneys we're helping our heart and we're helping our whole body a whole body in process yes if the kidney does not have to work that hard it tends to have a good uh, longevity because we all the time we see these patients who are coming back 20 years, 30 years after transplant. And uh, yes, and one of the common factor is that they tend to be um, around close to their ideal body weight and just general diet lifestyle practices and maintenance of adequate immunosuppression, of course, that's very important. Yeah, can't forget the medicine. <laughs> well, so thank this is you good. so much. Well, thank you. And we've covered so many topics though. We really, 
appreciate it. And um, we, we will, to the people still on the line, that we will be, this is recorded. It will be posted to our website. Uh, write me at info at B-A-A-K-T if you did not get the handout, but you should have received the handout of the slides last night. So thank you again, Dr. Garg. Thank this you. Thank you, Brenda. And, um, thank you to everybody that attended. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. so much. Bye. Bye.